This man is a cannibal who smears ashes all over his body and drinks liquor out of human skulls. Weeks after an American man was believed to have been killed by a tribe on a remote island, his body remains there. From the dense rainforests of the Amazon to the west coast of Thailand, exist several communities with the strangest cultures and traditions. Prepare to be amazed by the tribe that lives in houses as high as 140 feet, the tribe that lives most of their lives in water, and many more. Ready for this exhilarating ride? These are the most mysterious tribes in the world, starting with the Asaro Mudmen, the terrifying warriors of Papua. Yes, get ready to be terrified by the appearance of this tribe, also known as the Mudmen. They are an indigenous tribe from the eastern highlands of Papua New Guinea and are renowned for their unique ceremonial masks and traditional Sing Sing ceremonies. They live in small communities close to Goroka, near the Asaro River, from which they derive their name, and they have several tribes and numerous clans within their communities living on either side of the river. The amazing thing about them is that they still live traditionally and the dialect of the tribes can differ significantly due to their isolated habitats. The Asaro tribe speaks the Dano dialect, which is part of the Kainantu Goruka language family occurring only in a small part of Papua New Guinea. But you see, the terrifying part is their famous mud masks called holosas, meaning spirit, which are a significant part of their cultural heritage. This is not just a name made up in their heads, there's actually a story behind it. According to legend, when a neighboring tribe once attempted to attack the peaceful Asaro, they fled and hid in the nearby Asaro River. When they eventually emerged, their bodies were covered with white clay and gray mud from the riverbed. Their enemies mistook them for spirits and ran away in confused terror. The Asaro took advantage of this fear and used it as a tool to avoid battle, covering themselves in mud from the river and creating terrifying masks from clay, stones, and other natural materials to ward off their enemies. From that day, the masks have been known as spirits. To this day, the Asaro continue to create and wear these masks, often using them in ceremonies and festivals. They all have a unique style to them depending on the creator's imagination. Some may feature horns or tusks, while some may have ears and noses. They also use bamboo to create elongated fingers and make strange movements to add to the eerie effect. We can only hope this tribe's enemies are not watching this video right now. But for now, let's talk about the Matze's tribe. On the Peru-Brazil frontier in the Amazon rainforest lives about 2,200 Matze's, a tribe that sees every plant as medicine. What marks the international border that separates their home is the rush of the Yacarana River that runs through the heart of their land. To the Matze's, the river is not just a border, but a major source of livelihood where children and adults catch fish for survival daily. This tribe feeds on organic foods, banking on a wide variety of crops that grow in their gardens, including staples such as plantain and manioc. One common thing in every Maste's home is a boiling drink known as chapo, made from sweet plantain. If there's anything you may find bizarre, it is the usage of frogs. Frogs aren't just a culinary delicacy. They also have a practical use. One species of green tree frog known as akate secretes a fluid that is used by both men and women for courage and energy and to increase hunting ability. Men collect the fluid by rubbing the frog's skin with a stick and then apply it onto small holes burnt into the receiver's skin. Soon, dizziness and nausea make way for a feeling of clarity and strength that can last for several days. Generally, the Masti's tribe has a deep understanding of how forest plants can be used to cure illness. To them, plants and animals have spirits just as humans do and can ail or heal a human body. A healer will identify the cause of his patient's illness and treat it with its respective plant medicine. For example, sore throat can be caused by eating howler monkey meat and can be treated by a plant that resembles the monkey's voice box. Yeah, it's all strange, but pretty amazing. Next is the red people of the Himba tribe. The Himba are today a relatively small group of no more than around 50,000 people who live in the northern region of Namibia. The Himba culture and the people have come a long way. They have survived not only the harsh climate of their land, but also war and persecution. And today, their culture stands strong as it was around 100 years ago, with the women still coloring their skin with red ochre, and the ancestral fires still burning in the center of the homesteads. The Himba are a semi-nomadic people, who live a conservative life in a very isolated area. While the Himba are not cut off from Namibian development, they do maintain their cultural practices and way of life. 
The fascinating thing is the Himba children do go off to school to be educated, and the group does benefit from Namibian conservancies. But at the same time much has remained unchanged, as the Himba people do not want their cultures to fade away into civilization. The red color on the women is decoration on their skins, made with red ochre, mixed with butterfat. After marriage, they also color their braids with the mixture. In the Himba tribe, both the men and women braid their hair according to what stage they are in life. Children will wear two braided plaits, while girls in the puberty stage wear their hair braided forward, with the plait covering their eyes. Single young men will have their plaits braided backward. After marriage, women will wear an elaborate headdress of streams of braids colored red with ochre, while married men wear a turban of plaits. Considering their access to the modern world, the Himba people are quite mysterious, but not as mysterious as the Agori tribe. This tribe is believed to be over a thousand years old, but you see, their practices are quite shocking. They are followers of a Hindu sect often regarded as sadhus, which means good or holy man, and have devoted their entire lives to the achievement of moksha meaning liberation. Unlike other sadhus, however, the Agori follow an unconventional and radical path towards enlightenment. These practices are considered contradictory to orthodox Hinduism, and the Agori have earned a reputation as being the most feared sadhus in India. They worship Shiva or Mahakala, the destroyer, and Shakti or Kali, the goddess of death, which explains why they are feared. The Agori are usually found residing near cremation sites, most famously in Varanasi. Nevertheless, they can also be found in other areas that are much more remote, including the cold caves of the Himalayas, the dense jungles of Bengal, and the hot deserts of Gujarat. One of the most famous practices of the Agori is cannibalism. It must be noted that the Agori do not deliberately kill people for their flesh. Instead, it is the flesh of corpses brought to the cremation grounds that they consume. This human flesh is often eaten raw, though at times it is roasted over an open fire. Scary, right? Don't blame them yet. They believe that distinctions are merely delusions and are obstacles in the path of one's spiritual development. Thus, they see no difference between good and evil, nor do they see a difference between human and animal flesh. As if that was not enough, the Agori are also known to drink urine and eat feces. Now, we need a minute to puke. As crazy as it sounds, these practices supposedly help to kill the ego and derail the human perception of beauty. Another Agori practice is the shunning of clothes. They often move around with nothing but a loincloth, and at times, in the nude. This act is meant to allow the Agori to overcome their feelings of shame, and is also aimed at the renunciation of the material world, and attachment to material objects. Additionally, the Agori smear themselves with ash from human cremated remains, which is meant as an imitation of Shiva, and is believed to protect the Agori from diseases. You will also find them going about with skulls. The skull, known as Kapala, is the real sign of the Agori and once initiated, an Agori will go in search of this object. The skull is then used as a bowl for all the Agori consumes. They also share this bowl with animals such as dogs and cows, which clearly shows they truly do not see the need to differentiate between good and bad. You must agree we need a break, and what better place to breathe in fresh air if not on the tall tree houses of the Korowai tribe. The Korowai tribe is a fascinating tribe only recently discovered in Papua New Guinea. Up until the 1970s, there had been no previous recorded contact between them and the Western world. In fact, scientists believe the tribe may not have ever realized anyone else even existed other than themselves. One of the most amazing engineering feats of the isolated and primitive tribe is their ability to construct a great treehouse that sits 140 feet high in the jungles. Yes, a treehouse as high as a 10-story building. The treehouses are constructed and placed on stilts, which were designed to protect the members from rival villages. These basic structures are only accessed by wooden ladders, placed up against the stilts to reach the top. The central pole is made from a banyan tree, with the bark of sago palm used for the floor and walls, while the roof is made from the sago leaves. The tribe understood that the greatest danger for these houses would be fire, so they created fire pits to protect the hut. Their houses are not as mysterious as their beliefs which include outsiders carrying demons and evil spirits. It is believed that until the 70s, they may not have ever realized anyone else in the world existed outside their tribe. Some of them still have probably never seen a white person in their life, and if any appears, 
he may just end up in a pot of soup. Yes, it is no secret that this tribe practices cannibalism. Because of the Korowai belief in evil spirits, it was necessary to kill and eat a person they believed had been taken over by a demon known as Kakua. While some believe the claim is just for a good story to fascinate foreigners, some believe that the practice is still carried out today. We don't want to find out, right? Let's head straight to Russia to see the Nenets. Russia's most iconic reindeer folk. The Nenets are known for their unique herding style, which they have continued in modern times. This practice has survived a tumultuous history, and the Nenets remain the keepers of Siberia's Arctic, despite new challenges threatening their traditions and way of life. The effects of climate change and the pursuit of natural resources continually threaten their ability to use their native land as earlier generations have done. Despite this, the Nenets are a robust people. Who are determined to preserve traditional customs and practices. What is central to the Nenets culture is reindeer herding, and unlike other reindeer herding people, the Nenet move massive herds between winter and summer pastures, traversing thousands of kilometers a year across frozen rivers in temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. This integral practice illustrates the nomadic traditions of the Nenets, who travel with their herds. Apart from using the reindeer as a source of food, income, shelter, transportation and clothing for the people, the animal is so revered within the tribe that it is often included in marriage dowries. The tribe believes that reindeer give themselves to humans for nourishment and transport in exchange for protection from predators along their migratory route. As a result of this belief, there is a kind of spiritual relationship between the Nenets and their precious beasts. Just like Santa, they don't move without their reindeer. Surma Tribe Though invariably referred to by other Ethiopians as nomads, the Surma along with all the other nomads of the region are no longer nomadic in the true sense of the word. They may once have been when people were far fewer, and competition for grazing much less, but nowadays they live a mostly settled life depending on cultivated grains for the greater part of their subsistence. But majorly, they herd cattle for a living, and this image of themselves as nomadic pastoralists persists in folklore. The Surma are well known for their stick fighting, which is a fascinating scene as described. At a fight, each contestant is armed with a hardwood pole about six feet long with a weight of just under two pounds. In the attacking position, this pole is gripped at its base with both hands, the left above the right to give maximum swing and leverage. Each player beats his opponent with his stick as many times as possible with the intention of knocking him down and eliminating him from the game. Players are usually unmarried men so you already know where this ends. The winner is carried away on a platform of poles to a group of girls waiting at the side of the arena, who decide among themselves which of them will ask for his hand in marriage. Talking about Surma women, these women's appearance may shock you. They wear lip plates, which are pierced in their early 20s and progressively stretched over the period of a year. A clay disc indented like a pulley wheel is squeezed into the hole in the lip, and as it stretches, ever larger discs are forced in, until the lip is so long it can sometimes be pulled right over the owner's head. Why? The size of the lip plate determines the bride price, with a large one bringing in 50 head of cattle. The women make the lip plates from clay, color them with ochre and charcoal, and bake them in a fire. Since we're talking about mysterious women of the Surma tribe, let's take a peek into our subscriber's pick. Look at this giant woman amid average height women looking thrice their size. This image makes us wonder if giants truly exist in a part of our world. Although giants are said to have gone extinct about 60,000 years ago, a mysterious tribe can prove us wrong existing with a height so tall, they can be called descendants of giants. This tribe has a lot of strong people with intimidating heights that make you feel like a dwarf. Since we are here already, why don't we just talk about the Marind Anim tribe. Generally, there are two state regions on Papua Island, which is also known as New Guinea Island. The eastern side is a part of Papua New Guinea, and the western side is a part of Indonesia. However, this tribe takes us to the Indonesian territory which starts from Sorong to Merauke, where West Papua Giant Man exists. Don't be confused, the Giant Man is also known as the Marind Anim tribe, one of the biggest tribes that live in Merauke. Aside from Merauke, they also live in southern Papua, starting on the right and left side of the Bian River to the Moeli River in the west. It is common knowledge that Papuan people have a good physique with most of them tall, big and strong compared to the average other Indonesian, especially those who are living in the coastal area of Papua. However, the tallest among them were the people of the Marind tribe, or call them Marind Anim. The word Anim itself literally means men. Then, the women in the Marin tribe call themselves Marind Anam, because the word Anam literally means women. Most members of Marind Anam can have a height from 190 centimeters to more than 2 meters. In fact, 
teenagers aged 14 to 15 in this tribal group, can reach 180 centimeters in height. This height is certainly much higher than the average height of most Indonesians. But what do they do with this height? Most of them work as farmers and cultivators. However, some hunt for animals and catch fish in the river. Are you thinking about making them athletes right now? It's probably not going to work, except they will compete with people like them only. I mean, Lionel Messi is just 1.7 meters tall. Next is the Mokan tribe. They are an Austronesian ethnic group with about 2,000 members who maintain a nomadic, sea-based culture. Maybe not the type of sea culture you think, these people literally live in water like fish. Their epithet is, the Mokan are born, live and die on their boats, and the umbilical cords of their children plunge into the sea. The Mokan only live on land during the monsoon, for about three months a year. For this reason, their babies indeed learn to swim before they walk, and learn to dive while they are still very young children. Being the skilled divers and navigators they are, the Mokan people primarily collect mollusks, hunt for fish and trade them for rice. They have the extraordinary ability to hold their breath and see underwater for a time that far exceeds the capability of an ordinary, healthy human. As a result, what is not consumed is dried atop their boats and then used to barter for other necessities at local markets. During the monsoon season, they build additional boats while occupying temporary huts. Because of the amount of time they spend diving for food, Mokan children can see better underwater due to the accommodation of their visual focus. Another interesting thing about these children is that they are less bothered by salt water, and their skin apparently responded to sustained exposure to seawater by developing a white, scale-like layer, with an appearance somewhat resembling that of the hereditary dermatological disease ichthyosis, just like portrayed in the Disney animation Luca, which makes us wonder if they are 100% human or half-human, half-fish. Another mysterious tribe is Brokpa tribe a tribe famous for their distinctive tall and sharp physical features with just about 4,000 members left in the world. They have long been known as the last pure specimens of the Aryan race, thanks to their height and sharp blue eyes. However, some believe they are direct descendants of soldiers of Alexander the Great's army, who stayed back in the region nearly 2,000 years ago, while local folklore suggests that they migrated from Gilgit in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Although DNA testing presents a picture of an ancient and isolated community, there is little evidence to suggest where they really came from. Many anthropologists dispute the Aryan claim, suggesting that this description is a legacy of British Orientalist scholars who were deeply invested in the practice of racial categorization. However, they have a particular belief that is interesting. If you see a brakpa adorned with props, don't you think it's all about fashion? They believe so much in the powers of these props, serving medicinal purposes. For example, the seven colored ribbon wards off any ailment caused by the sun or eclipse, the silver brooches ward off planetary influences, and the peacock feather wards off paralysis. Although nothing is confirmed, for this tribe to have proclaimed this belief, it must have worked for them in the past. You must agree that the Brakpa tribe is very friendly with strangers. However, you can't say the same for the Kujareno tribe. This tribe was first seen in photos taken during a tour of the Amazonian rainforest. The photo indicates that this tribe lives in the Amazon and has had no contact with modern civilization. Also known as the Macho Piro clan, the Kujareno people have not allowed foreigners into their land. Reportedly, they killed two men with a bow and arrow after they tried to make contact with them. After 600 years of isolation, the nomadic clan has become increasingly threatened by loss of habitat due to logging. As a result, they are beginning to leave the refuge of the forest with violent results. In 2011, they also murdered a local guide known as Shaco Flores, who had been in touch with the Macho Piro clan for 20 years. The relationship is thought to have soured when he tried to convince them to abandon their traditional ways. He was later found with an arrow through his heart. However, recently, the tribe's recipients of goods from missionaries have increased, which indicates they may soon be open to the industrialized society. If you thought you'd seen it all, you haven't seen the Ruck tribe. 10 years before the Ruck tribe was discovered, UNESCO recognized the Fongnake Bang National Park as a world natural heritage site, and soon it became a destination for domestic and international tourists and experts. But nobody knew that deep in the jungle of the national park lived the Rook people in their villages. For a very long time, Rook people lived far from the community, which made them shy people who favored a primitive lifestyle. Since they have been known, the life of this ethnic group is still a big mystery to experts. Imagine a human climbing trees like a chimpanzee. These people swing on trees and they do it without clothes on. 
They have no family names, no tribal name, and they live in caves that let water pass through, which are called Ruk in the local dialect. So others call the people the Ruk. The Ruk once agreed to leave the caves, and when they did, they were 109 persons. They usually run away from strangers and live a natural life hunting and gathering in the high mountains. Both men and women tied their hair behind them, covering their bodies with antiar bark, and to worsen the case, they slept sitting up. They sometimes miss the cave and go back to it to stay for months. However, they are likely to accept civilization, unlike most tribes on this list. Guarani Tribe Have you ever seen anyone with six toes or six fingers? Meet the Huarani tribe with about not one, not two, but 4,000 people having extra toes and fingers. What is more interesting to note is that the structure of their feet with the extra toes even changes over time. Although they were born with straight toes, their feet adapt to their environment with time, giving the toes a completely different structure. If the look of these people isn't mysterious enough, their language is one of the most mysterious things about them. They speak Huarani language, an isolated language not known to be related to any other language. This untraceable language has made it difficult to trace the true origin of the mysterious tribe, and because of that, nobody knows their history. Another reason why this tribe's origin is difficult to know is because over the years, they have refused every contact attempt from the civilized world. According to reports, American missionaries in Ecuador once attempted to contact the Huarani in the 1950s with airdropped gifts, but when they attempted to land a small airplane to communicate with the tribe, six Huarani tribesmen killed them with spears. Since the news of the attack circulated, the Huarani tribe has been observed from afar, and so little information has been gathered. One of the known things about this tribe is their occupation, which is primarily hunting monkeys and other small animals as a major food source by using spears and blowguns. The main initial hunting weapon is the blowgun, which is typically three to four meters long. The arrows used are dipped in curare poison, which paralyzes the muscles of the animal with which it is hit so that it cannot breathe. However, since the 20th century, the tribe has relied more on rifles for hunting. Also, there has been a significant shift from a hunting and gathering society to a society that lives mostly in permanent forest settlements. However, it is best to note that we may never understand this mysterious tribe as they may never accept any contact from the outside world forever. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.